Amen. Well, I want to read Mark chapter 11, in Mark chapter 11, and uh, the verses are 24 through 26. We've been emphasizing and focusing on mercy this morning, and um, Mark chapter 11, the uh, thing that stands out to me in that chapter is, of course, where Jesus cursed the fig tree and it died, and uh, anybody using a Bible that's not backlit this morning? Raise your hand. Okay, do we need a little more light? Do we need a little more light, or can you see all right? You're good, huh? Okay, great. It looks a little dark from up here, but we can we, we, we can now set it wherever we need to, and so that, that'll be, that's what we need to do, so great. Well, um, let's read this. It says uh, in verse um, 24 through 26, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. Now, that's a challenge right there. I don't know if any of you have had that challenge. And you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive, forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's a, that's a strong, strong warning. It's carried out in other passages in the, in the New Testament. And I'm not going to try to explain how that fits together with the goodness of God that we declare, but that's what Jesus said, and I just want to stay away from uh, getting, uh, walking in a way that that, wouldn't, uh, that that would have to apply to my life. Amen? So um, the word and in verse 25 says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. And that, that is a Greek word that can also be translated uh, as also or so then. And so he says, what I want you to get out of this whole scenario where he had uh, cursed the fig tree, and then he said, say unto the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and believe in your heart whatever you say will come to pass, and you'll have whatever you say. And as, as he moves into this next um, um, revelation, he says, I want you to, when you ask, believe that you receive it. And then he links up what he says after that with the word and, or also, or so then. If you're going to be able to believe that you receive something that you ask, you're going to have to be in a realm of forgiving all the time. This is what he's saying. He said it's going to affect your ability to believe for receiving this add on and also so so then if you're going to believe that you receive so then you'll have to forgive as your father has forgiven your trespasses and he's connected the the showing of mercy with the ability to believe that you're going to receive what you're asking him for I don't know why that is it seems like they're completely separate things but but they're not Jesus said they're not good enough for me and um, and so I want to talk to you this morning about increasing our faith for believing that we receive what we pray for by increasing our awareness of showing mercy I was thinking about that the last couple of days and I realized I said well Lord I don't think I show mercy that much I don't think I'm doing too good at that and uh he said, well, remember when you let that car go by instead of you pulling out? You know, I mean, you were in the line of cars over here on, on the Highway 80, and the cars were waiting to get in to the line. He said, remember how you stopped and you let them in? He said, it's showing mercy. And uh, I said, oh, thank goodness, you know. <laughs> I have an act of mercy to my credit somewhere. <laughs> but but it's, it's, this message is for me, too. I think we live in a day when there's no quarter given and no quarter asked. And what that phrase means is that there will be no mercy shown, and I'm not asking you for mercy, but what that means is the fight is to the death. We live in a day where you can't have a disagreement without there being a reaction that's like, you can't disagree with me. I have no mercy for disagreement. And it, it's a day that's just vindictive and vicious and uh, and as the church we're not just supposed to be a subculture we're supposed to be a counterculture that moves in a different flow of the spirit 
not just um, drifting with whatever the culture is doing and saying and emphasizing, but actually going against the stream. And so if the culture is saying, you can't get away with anything I don't agree with you about, you're going to be held, uh, I'm going to confront you, I'm going to uh, uh, protest you, I'm going to uh, uh, lie about you and accuse you. And in the midst of that um, atmosphere, the church is supposed to be going, I'm going to find a way to show mercy. I'm, I'm, not, going to be, I'm not going to compromise my core values. But I'm going to be merciful because I, God has been merciful to me. And I'm going to find a way to show mercy. And that's not always easy. And uh, Jesus said if you um, do it just to your friends, you don't do much more than the world does. And so he's talking about being uh, graced in a way, and I appreciate what Bill said about that, being graced in a way that we're empowered to show mercy to our enemies. You say, well, they didn't show mercy to us. I said, well... You know, if you don't want to be like them, you need to show mercy to them. Otherwise, we're no better than they are. And so, um, and we need wisdom in how to do that, and and when to do that, and where that fits. But uh, but I know I know we're um, we're the Holy Spirit wants to make us more aware of the opportunities, not just defend ourselves, and not just close the door, and not just make sure everything's secure and safe, but beware of opportunities to where. We can take a little bit of a risk and, and be better at showing mercy. And so um, I know he wants to bless that. It says in, uh, the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 2.10, You were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And I was, I was uh, as I was studying this, I was asking the Lord, there's, uh, you know, there's passages that, and parables that are, that are pretty wordy, and I could uh, go f past them pretty quickly, and uh, I felt like the Lord wanted me at least to read this one in its entirety, and it, um, dem Jesus demonstrates with a parable what Peter just said, you're someone who has obtained mercy. Now, that's, a, that's a, a significant condition because you're surrounded by people who have not obtained mercy. And so because you have received much, guess what? Much is required. You've obtained mercy. Now, there's some mercy required for you to show. And that's, that's simple. But look, let's look at this parable and read it. And Jesus these are words of Jesus. I think we can get grace just by reading it, just by hearing it. So he says in verse 21, Peter comes to him, and I like, I like Peter. He's always got the, a question that's really practical. He says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And I thought Peter was probably thinking, and I would think, that's pretty magnanimous. I mean, seven times, I mean, my goodness. What do you expect, Jesus? He's, and I, I think what Jesus did with this parable, he said, I expect a lot more because of the mercy I've shown you so many more than seven times. And so it says in verse 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven <coughs> is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That equals $10 million in our day. Some, some say, I think there's some variation on that, but it's a lot of money. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and with his wife and children and that all, all that he had and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, compassion that had the uh, one of the elements of it was mercy because mercy takes action mercy does something it doesn't just have uh, sympathy so it said uh, have patience with the master had compassion and released him and forgave him all his debt he didn't just release him to be able to work and earn and continue to pay off his debt he released him into a condition of total freedom because the debt was canceled completely 
And the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, verse 28, who owed him a hundred denarii, denarii, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat. This isn't going good from the start. Saying, pay me what you owe. So a hundred denarii is equal to $20. He just got forgiven a million, and he's confronting this guy and accosting him over 20. Something's completely out of whack. Dan led us in uh, Thanksgiving. Rather than being grateful and thankful, it sounds like he's not even been uh, uh, affected by the mercy that was shown to him. So verse 29, he says, His fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would, would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, when his fellow servants saw what had been, they were, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you. He's answering Peter, who's going to be the apostle of his church. So my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. This parable of the unmerciful servant is a clear warning that to whom mercy is given, mercy is required, or it opens up our own condition to the sufferings reserved for the unforgiving people. Those, I mean, for those that haven't experienced mercy, to those who have not obtained mercy. We end up having the same condition they have, which is, which is a, a suffering. I don't know if you remember what it was like before you got saved. Maybe you got saved when you were four or five, and that is so wonderful. But I remember the condition of the one who had not obtained mercy. I was 20. I, when I got saved, I was right before I turned 21. And when I went down the aisle and he gave the altar call and he had been preaching fire and brimstone, and that was wonderful because I'd, never, I'd heard all the Bible stories. I had the background from the Catholic Church of, the, of, of David and the Giant. I had all the Bible stories, and I believed it all, virgin birth and all that. It's just that I'd never had a miraculous regeneration of my heart by putting my faith in Jesus Christ personally. And when he got through preaching down there, I'd heard it put in such succinct ways, I knew I was going to hell. And you say, well, you shouldn't scare people like that. Well, it scared me right to heaven, and I appreciate him scaring me that way. And when I went down the aisle, I felt lame, uh, flames licking at my heels, and I remember when I looked around, it was, it was like I was going down there with a bunch of grade school kids and other kids getting saved at a 12 and 13, and I was here, I was 20. And it didn't bother me a bit. I just didn't want to go to hell. And <laughs> Hey, we don't talk about that much anymore, do we? But one of the things that obtaining mercy means is you're not going to hell anymore. Hey, you said, you mean I was going to hell before Jesus? Yeah, you were already on your way there. He's not sending you there. He kept you from going there. What a wonderful, merciful Savior. Thank you for doing that, Lord. I sometimes we forget that's a good thing to be thankful for. Well, hallelujah. So, so this, this parable warns us, you know, you've received a great mercy, and now you ought to have a, a merciful approach. Just It ought to be just automatic. Now, maybe you're going to have to be cautious about how that's um, manifested, but you're going to be automatic about wanting to show mercy. And so because we've obtained mercy, we have mercy to show. We, we were once just people. He said you were once not, a, not the people of God. You were just people. Ephesians said you were without Christ, aliens from the, the blessings, promises, and rights of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. I was feeling that at 20. I felt hopeless. I felt the burden of my sin. I felt it on me as I went down the aisle. I felt it lift when I gave my life to Christ. I came out and the world looked brighter. The, the grass looked greener. The, the, everything looked better. Thank you, Lord, for the mercy of God. 
And, and because of that, it would have been good if somebody would have taken me aside and said, hey, you just received mercy now. It would be a good thing if you showed mercy. But I didn't really have anybody tell me that. Not that I shouldn't have figured it out. But uh, I know that this morning the Lord's saying to us, we're going to have a greater and greater opportunities to manifest the condition of having obtained mercy and crossing the threshold into the identity of being the people of God. He said, you were once just people, but now you've obtained mercy and become the people of God. It's a threshold that you cross. It's a very significant thing to have obtained mercy. So Dan mentioned it this morning and has mentioned it in the past. Um, the um, um, Right before the inauguration of President Trump, there was a, um, a vision from a prophet that was given to Dutch Sheets where he envisioned, uh, I believe it was a vision, maybe in a dream, but coins were falling from heaven, silver and gold coins. And they were falling at such a rate that they built up around Dutch Sheets <coughs> an uh, uh, ankle deep. And he bent down, he picked some up, and on the back of some of them was a flag, and on the back of others was an eagle. But on each one of them, the other side was the engraved word mercy. And the Lord said to the man that saw this, he said, mercy is the new currency. And, um, you know, if you think about that, just, just in logical terms, if mercy is like money, man, there's all kinds of courses out there on how to steward your money, how to, how to invest it, how to use it, how to, how to increase it. If, if mercy is currency, if it's like money, then we need to have some understanding about stewarding, stewarding mercy. And um, I, I've called this this morning, Stewarding Mercy. And... Um, the scripture gives us some ideas about how to increase the mercy that you've obtained. And one of them is in Matthew 5, 7, he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So mercy seems to be like something that you, one scripture in Proverbs says, Cast your bread on the waters, and not many days it will come back to you. And I've noticed when I let cars out in front of me on Highway 80 when you can't get out, the next time I'm sitting there, people let me out. You can call it reaping what you sow, but reaping what you sow, if you use it right, is merciful. I mean, it's a way that you can control the outcome or what affects your life is sow the right thing so that you can reap the right kind of harvest. But mercy, when you sow it, comes back to you. And uh, when you give it, it seems like it's increased. But there's another way. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. So the focus generally is on grace. You know, I need grace. I need the empowerment. I need what grace provides. But if we don't obtain mercy and continue to obtain mercy from the throne of grace, then uh, we're missing an opportunity to keep our account, mercy account full so that we have mercy to give out. Have you ever heard of compassion fatigue? Compassion is composed of empathy, sympathy, and mercy. Now, empathy, you feel their pain, but that's not, that's not going to help their pain. Sympathy, you've been in their shoes before, and, and, um, and you, you just um, you weep for them. And uh, sometimes when I'm praying for people, I really don't like sympathetic people helping me because it's just like they're rubbing all over them, but they're releasing no faith, you know. <laughs> oh, it's... I'm so brokenhearted that you're in your condition. Well, I'm glad you are. But I'm trying to get them out of the condition. And so we need people that cross over into mercy where mercy takes action to get the people free and to, and to see a change. And so, um, and so we need to obtain mercy from the throne of grace that we might have mercy uh, to give. Compassion fatigue is a very real thing. Joe and I were at the football game the other night. We got some texts, you know. I'm going, you know, I'm just at a, I just want to be away from the crisis of people's lives. And you can't when you're welcome to the ministry, you know. But there's a grace for that. And so, but, but there is a compassion fatigue you feel. And so I've got one uh, 
one brother that has a healing ministry on Facebook. And people from, I guess, all over the world send in their, their crisis healing situation, their, their uh, you know, disease situations, and I avoid his Facebook thing because I can't handle it anymore. I don't want to read everybody's sicknesses. I, can, I don't have enough to go around. I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough mercy or grace. I don't know what you call it. But I don't, you all are looking at me like, well, what's wrong with you anyway? And I'm going, pray for me. Have mercy for me. Have mercy on me. And uh, I want to be uh, able to help and ha handle what the Lord's put in my path and in the lane I run in. So we need mercy to show mercy. There's mercy available by showing it. There's mercy available by going into the throne room of grace. He said, come boldly. You are the people who have obtained mercy. You can come boldly into this throne room. You can come boldly into the presence of Christ. You can come out of the presence like we had this morning down here at the front. I really believe there was a bath of mercy. I really believe that you're going to have mercy that you didn't have before. The mercy is going to manifest in different ways. It's going to show up in your physical condition, in the favor on your life. It's going to show up in your ability to show it to other people, to show it in the situations where you may have been just too tired to to take anymore but mercy is going to be available in the culture of Jesus today mercy was not held in high regard the Romans valued justice courage discipline and power but viewed mercy as a weakness and uh, one Roman philosopher called it the disease of the soul so Jesus this is the culture Jesus was in <clears throat> uh, that was influenced by this because apparently the religious elites also had a low value of mercy and Jesus rebuked them for it in uh, Matthew 23 verses 23 through 24 he said woe to you you religious leaders scribes and Pharisees you hypocrites for you pay tithe well praise God they're paying tithe Jesus said that's good of mint and, and anise and cumin and those are little bitty seeds they're making sure that they're paying their tithe you know they're counting out the little tiny seeds and making sure if they got a hundred they're going to give ten the amazing thing is, Jesus says, this you ought to have done. This is a good thing to do. Tithing's a good thing. These things you ought, uh, he said, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. <clears throat> and then Jesus gives us all license to exaggerate by saying blind guides who strain out not gnats and swallow camels. Well, nobody's swallowing a camel. But Jesus wanted to make a point, and so exaggeration to make a point uh, is sanctioned by the Lord. Hallelujah. So <laughs> take that with a grain of salt, okay? <clears throat> so gnats were unclean to the Jews, and so were camels. So they didn't want to accidentally ingest something that would make them unclean, so they would strain out. They'd pour their, their drink, whatever they were drinking, they poured through claws and things like that and they were very careful about not ingesting a gnat but Jesus said while you're doing that counting all your little seeds making sure you're tired you're swallowing a camel your life is choked up by the fact you're not showing mercy you're not you're not walking in faith you're not being just and you're not showing mercy and you've got the the uncleanness that comes as if you'd swallowed a whole camel and I think they got the point because after they began to, you know, challenge him more. But uh, he exaggerated to get this across that missing mercy opportunities is like missing a camel in your cup. <laughs> I hope you all got a picture of that, that little cup and you got a big camel trying to fit in there. But missing mercy opportunities is swallowing the wrong thing. <clears throat> so Jesus came to model mercy, and this is just still basically the introduction and and we won't, we won't. <laughs> maybe I can get to it another time Bill's going to bring the word next Sunday though by the way because our daughter has been declared by the doctors that she's going to have her baby on Friday and last time they induced her on Friday it took 28 hours so I needed to free up our weekend and Bill graciously uh, was available to, to bring the word and that's going to be good but uh, and so maybe I can finish this another time. But um, <clears throat> Jesus came, you know, it says very clearly, He was the express image of the Father. <clears throat> and He modeled for us mercy. 
And he did it so well that Peter must have got it. As, as uh, hard-headed and as difficult for Peter to catch things, he must have caught this because when Peter denied Jesus three times, it was against the backdrop of his boasting that he would never deny him and that he would die with him. At least the other disciples, when they ran away, they hadn't boasted that they would never do that. But Peter did. And so it was a great failure. And then uh, when, they, when the ladies came and they said, Hey, wait a minute. But guys, guys, he's risen from the dead. Peter didn't run away. He ran to the empty tomb. That's the opposite of what Adam did. When Adam was failed, he ran and hid. Because what he, his understanding of God was he didn't have the mercy component in there that, that Peter caught from Jesus. Jesus did a good job of modeling it. And so he gets to the empty tomb. He goes in, and Jesus is already gone. So now they're out on the lake after the resurrection, and they're fishing, and Jesus comes up in the morning, and he builds a fire, and he's cooking some fish. And he says, hey, children, have you caught any fish? They said, no, we haven't. And Peter's like, who, would, who is that? And he said, throw the net on the other side, and it's, it, it's immediately full. And John says, that's the Lord. John picked up on it immediately. And Peter, it says, wrapped his cloak around him and dove in and swam to Jesus. He ran to him and he swam to him. That tells me he recognized what Jesus had to offer was mercy. He failed so horribly. Of course, you know the story. Jesus said, do you love me, Peter, three times? And Peter said, yes. And so I believe Jesus took him through that to cancel out the times of denial, the three times he denied him. So we've got a wonderful, merciful Savior. He has been touched, it says in Scripture, with the feelings of our infirmities. And so because he has come as a man, he sits at the right hand of the Father as a man who can sympathize and empathize with our condition. He didn't go back and become spirit again. He went, he's still a man. He's a glorified man at the right of the Father. And so when you go to him, you say, Lord, I am really tempted or I'm really challenged by this issue. He says, yeah, I, I know what that feels like. I mean, if he, could, if he could say, I know what that feels like. And so he has mercy for us when we fail in those things. Always mercy, always mercy. But we've got, to, we've got to believe that and ask Him for it and receive it. So His mercy is rooted in compassion because He's felt what we felt. But one of the things that we've got to, we've got to realize, in order to pray believing that we receive when we pray, we've got to recognize that His mercy is rooted in covenant also. God's mercy is rooted in the covenant He made clear back with Abraham. We are children of Abraham by faith. And He made a covenant with Abraham that you're going to be blessed from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, but you're going to be blessed so that you can be a blessing to the nations. And so when we come to the Lord in prayer, we've got to realize that the other uh, characteristic of God that is exemplified throughout the Scripture and in the life of Jesus is that He has the nature of a covenant keeper. Man, you can't be alive very long and not have experienced someone who breaks covenant, someone who, who breaks the agreement, breaks the contract. Uh, I heard just today that 50% of children are born to homes without a father. They left. Something didn't work out. I know it's not always the father that leaves, but 50% but of, of children grow up in homes today with no father. But our father keeps the covenant. And because he's a covenant keeper when we pray, there's so much faith that he wants to give me the answer. I was in Arlington, Texas, a, gosh, what... 12 years ago, longer than that, maybe 20 years ago, I was sent over there by the, the company I was working for, and we actually met with these people last night, had supper with them, but a friend of mine lives over there in Arlington, and I was over there working, and I got done, and he called me, he said, you want to go to a home group meeting? I said, well, sure. He came and picked me up, and we went to a gated community, 
and we went up to a house that had double doors and when the lady opened the doors there was the, the foyer itself was so big there was a baby grand piano in the foyer and she had traveled with and and uh, written songs for the gaithers apparently they did re really well uh, the house was a huge mansion we go in there's 13 or 14 people back in a you know in a big uh, um, den area and the guy's reading a book and he's 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 doing a uh, study on, on what to do now that the end times are here uh, you can be prepared if you get your your beans and find a cave and be ready to hide because it's coming down that's basically what the book was about so he's going through this and I sat down and and my friend sat down and the guy said after I sat down he said uh, he said I'm gonna finish this book report and and Brother David's going to bring the word. And I looked around. I thought, hey, there's another Brother David here. Isn't that interesting? And they were all looking at me. And my friend had lined me up to speak without telling me. <clears throat> that guy had such a negative book report that people were just out there like, have you got a gun where I can just shoot myself? Because it would be easier. And, and I'm going, what am I going to do? So I went to Ezekiel 22 where Jesus talked about the condition of Israel. I mean, not Jesus, but the, uh, the prophet talked about the condition of Israel was corrupt from the top to the bottom. The princes, the priests, the prophets, the people were ripe for judgment. All of them, all of them had failed miserably. And God lays it all out how they failed. But he gets to the verse where he says, and I sought for a man who would stand in the gap and build up a wall that I might not destroy them. He was still motivated. His nature was still, I want to show him mercy, but I need someone who will make the decree of heaven over them and begin to call my mercy forth and not just think because they deserve it, they're going to get it. Man, you don't know how many times I hear people say if God doesn't destroy America, he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. No, he doesn't want to destroy anything. He wants to show mercy. And I thank God today that there's a remnant of the church that has gotten it to where they don't look at the abortions and they don't look at all the sin. My sisters, where they went to college at, that town in Midwestern Kansas, and this is my wife's going to say, please don't say that, I'm going to say it anyway. Where they went to college at in Midwestern Kansas passed a law, Manhattan, Kansas passed a law last week that women can go topless everywhere oh yeah I'm going Midwestern Kansas are you kidding and, and I'm going how do you pray for a nation where the city commissions are just making sin a free for all Fort Collins Colorado is already that way it's a free for all and you say, well, how do I pray in faith that God really wants to show this kind of a nation mercy? It's because he's a covenant-keeping God. And Abraham knew that enough to say, well, if you can five, find ten, would you spare those two cities? God said, if I can find ten, they're going to be spared. Well, he couldn't, so he took Lot and his family out of the city. Stand with me, and let's just go out of here this morning declaring mercy over our situations and over our lives and, and when you pray please cast your cares away and take a position of confidence that God wants to answer your prayer because he's merciful and because he's got a covenant with you through Jesus Christ where he wants to show mercy like you you can't even believe Father in Jesus name You've highlighted this this morning because you want to answer some prayers in such a way that you've never been able to before because there was no faith released. But we have faith today that America will be saved, that our homes will be saved, our families will be saved, and we will serve the Lord once again because you are a merciful, covenant-keeping God. And so we pray that and we ask that. And I thank you, Lord, that your hearts of your people this morning in this place and under the umbrella of this ministry will experience the blood-washing bath of the blood of Jesus that lets mercy flow, that changes everything.
we adopt the idea that we can steward mercy and see great things happen if we'll use mercy as a currency. Right In Jesus' name, your people agree and say amen. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, come.